so the title for this talk is The Math Behind the Curtain, Uncovering the Research Propelling R Chain. Uh, and this talk uh, basically came out of, it, it's the talk that I wish that I had had um, coming into the R Chain space. Uh, so I, uh, my name is Jake, and um, I discovered R Chain about two years ago when uh, listening to Vlad and Greg talking on a Casper Hangout, and Greg was talking about math that I had no idea um, what he was saying at all. It was totally incomprehensible and mysterious, but it sounded like he had a, um, a way of thinking about distributive computation that was uh, well-founded, uh, and I wanted to dig deeper to see if this was true or not. Um, and so I went to the Pi Calculus paper that was suggested, and it, after a lot of work, got a few pages into it of the 50 pages. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then a little bit later, uh, Greg was offering a course uh, called Introduction to the Design of Computational Calculi. Uh, started a study group slash open collaborative learning session for that. Uh, and through that, was able to work through um, you know, the Pi Calculus, Rho Calculus, uh, a lot of the uh, ideas and like unpublished uh, row calculi um, presented by Greg, and um, through that made some connections uh, and had uh, uh, Christian Williams and Daniel Sakela, who are working with John Baez at uh, UC Riverside, um, came in and helped explain and teach you know from a low level some of the category theory behind uh, the little type algorithm, uh, and so that has been a really awesome and productive thing. And I want to invite you to join um, that group if you're interested in learning more about this stuff. Uh, I'm willing to meet you pretty much on any level. We've gotten, uh, we, we've basically been running since May. Uh, and if you go to this URL here, uh, you'll be able to find, uh, you'll find like the welcome page and there's like a link for email sign up or all the lectures that we've done and links to the YouTube videos, all the sessions are recorded, um, are online. Um, yeah, so we, we're, we're sort of taking a break uh, right now. Um, we kind of have approached, there were about 68 people who are signed up and get the invites for the session. Um, and sort of through our rough, sort of like going through all these papers, we've gotten uh, more and more technical uh, so that now jumping in would just sort of be difficult. Um, the plan is for the future is to maybe starting in October here, um, go back through everything that we've done, polish it up, maybe provide some more concrete exercises, um, and really start working towards something that feels more like a Coursera level content. Um, I, I think a lot of the research that's being done um, behind our chain, I think that's like one of the um, you know, mysterious and sort of coolest things. It's one of the main uh, reasons that I was attracted to the project, and I think many other people are attracted to the project. And I don't really want it to be that mysterious at the end of the day. I want us to all have at least some understanding and can be able to approach the papers. And when we hear all these, this motivation and talk about um, you know, computational calculi and um, you know, types as, as uh, propositions and all that kind of stuff, like what, uh, you know, I, I want us to have some like, concrete basis for understanding what's being talked about, because then we have um, hope for understanding. Uh, more there. So, yeah, uh, I, I really am willing to have anyone join, no um, background needed. Uh, but, so the, the talk today then is, I kind of wanted to give like a highlight, sweeping overview of everything that we've been doing for the past three months, um, and just give like, like a little entryway so that if you're, you, if you go to the Pi Calculus paper or go to the Rho Calculus paper that you at least have when the first you know, math symbols pop up, you have at least some idea of what's being talked about. So I'm gonna start with just what is a computational calculus? This isn't a calculus in the way that you know, your high school or college math teacher talked about it. It's something different, but we use the same name because I don't know, why not? Uh, so it really boils down to three things, uh, the grammar, the equivalences, and the reductions. So the grammar is the part of the language that allows us to answer, is this or is this not a valid program? Um, so this is the job that a parser 
has, if you're familiar with what a parser is. Um, equivalences then, uh, and, and it really, it is kind of like a grammar in how you can think of it like English grammar, right? So uh, you can think of writing down rules for, you know, I have a noun and a verb in a sentence and they're sort of related to each other in this way. And that would, that, that's what defines like a valid sentence. Um, it's a similar idea here. Um, then you have the equivalences that correct for any sort of fine-grainedness in your grammar that you didn't want to be there. So an English example is when you write down the statement, I love pizza and ice cream, uh, you really want that to mean the same exact thing as I love ice cream and pizza, right? So just because we had to write pizza before ice cream doesn't really, it's a distinction um, that we really didn't want to exist but has to exist because we're writing this thing down on paper. Um, and the final piece is the reductions, and these are what encode the actual like computation um, in our language. So I want to give an example calculus. And this is sort of like a pi-like calculus. It's not really the pi calculus. It's sort of a stripped-down version. Um, so the way we read this is we read this, we have p and or q are of the form, and then for each line here, it's like this zero or the thing on this line or the thing on that line or the thing on this line. And um, sorry, it's a bit confusing that in the, in the concurrent process calculi, this bar right here and this bar, um, we're using the same symbol, but this just means or and then something and then this, this bar has a different meaning than that. Um, so we can just, at this point, we're only talking about grammar. So we can just disregard what all of these things mean and um, we can just talk about the structure of the program. Um, so the, the other thing that we, you notice we have is in these definitions, we have these X's and Y's here. Um, so these uh, are, are also defined in our language and we'll define them here as just being any variable name. Um, so that's kind of a fuzzier definition, um, but that's, that's what we're gonna go with right now. So what are some examples of some processes that, um, that are of this form or that satisfy this grammar? Uh, so one of the valid terms, we could have Alice, and then that exclamation mark, and then email after it, right? And the way, reason we can do that is because if we're going through, we're seeing for this first example here, P or Q, well, we're trying to construct something of the form P or Q, so I don't want to need one of those to construct it. I don't know what any of them are yet. And we can go up a line, and we can say, okay, X and Y, if X and Y can be just any variable name, great, I can just put like Alice and email there. So that's exactly what I've done. Um, another valid term would just be zero, right? Zero is right there on, on this line. Um, <clears throat> and then here are some more examples. So this we've used a couple rules at the same time. So we've, we've used that rule, um, Right, that says if we have two processes, we can join them together with the sort of these parentheses and this bar in between them. And that's exactly what I've done right here with these two processes. Um, and so there's a similar thing here where we have the form, I wish I wasn't flipping back and forth between these, but we have these form that has like two variables and then a process. Same thing there. So. Any questions at this point about a grammar? Or what questions do you have about a grammar? Cool, moving on. So some, oh, I guess some invalid terms as well. All right, we need two things. This has only one thing. And then this Q needs to be defined. So this is an invalid term. Uh, so then we define our equivalences. So to talk about equivalences even, and what we want to be in our equivalent in our language, already we're getting at something about not just what the language is and how it's structured, but sort of what these terms mean. Um, so let's kind of define some meaning for these terms, and th this meaning is gonna be the pi calculus meaning. So um, we'll say that zero is our stopped process, or a process that does nothing. We'll say that this is a process that we read as um, for 
input something from x, call it y, in process p, and then this will read as x send y, and this will read as p in parallel with q, or p par q. So um, this is a process that's waiting on some name, we'll call these things names, uh, to, to receive a message, and then we'll continue as process p. This is um, a process that's sending a name to another name, and this is, um, this is two processes together, running in parallel. So when we talk about the equivalences, um, if we have a process running in parallel with a stop process, that should just be equal to the um, process. If we have two processes running in parallel, we should be able to flip them around. Um, and it really shouldn't matter if we have one process that is P and Q together, and we run that in parallel with R, that should be the same as P running in parallel with a process that's put together from Q and R. What questions do you have at this point? I want to make sure everyone is following along. Great. Okay. Um, and yeah, if all of this is making sense, hopefully I'll lose you later. <laughs> Um, so then we have our reductions. Uh, and our reductions are encoding the actual computation. They kind of look like this. They have something on the left-hand side of an arrow and then something of a right-hand side of the arrow. So what this reduction is going to mean is that if we have this send, right, remember we called this a send, and we called this a receive, and if they're happening in parallel and the receive is listening on X, the same name that we're sending on, then what we're going to do is we're going to just reduce this term, and we're going to say, OK, so um, the send meets the receive. So now p is going to carry on. But p is also going to be able to use the information that it received. So any time that we had a y in our process p, we are going to replace it with the thing that we've received, z. So that's what this syntax means. It means that I have a process p now, but every, in any place there was a y, we've now replaced it with a z. And that is, that's um, exactly the reduction rule for the pi calculus. So here are some example reductions. Say um, we have this name Fred, and we're sending Fred the message hello. And then let's say this process right here is representing um, Fred, or someone who's listening for the name Fred. So, uh, what they're doing is they are going to receive that message hello in message, um, and then they're going to do something else. So what this reduces to would be Alice, hello. What questions do you have there? So another process that we could have is we could imagine a whole process that's um, a lottery game. And this is, uh, you know, there's an example dApp on the test net that if you look at the code at it, it looks kind of almost exactly like this. We have, um, say, this like lottery name that's set up, and we have Alice, oh, my, mm -hmm. there should be exclamation marks there, sorry. Hmm? I made that mistake all the time. Yeah, yeah, so there should be exclamation marks there. So. Say that um, Alice has submitted her name to the lottery, Bob has submitted his name to the lottery, and then we have this lottery contract here um, that whenever we receive, uh, that, that whenever we receive uh, something from the name lottery, um, we are going to give them a ticket. All right, and because, and we can say that, you know, because the names are being sent to lottery, so lottery is receiving a name, so the name exclamation mark ticket will really reduce to something like this, right? So either Alice then is being sent the ticket because this name got replaced, or Bob is getting the ticket because um, Bob was the one who got this. So this is non-determinism in the language. We've have, we have one term here that has two different possible reductions into two different terms. So when we talk about non-determinism in Rolang, um, this is what we're talking about. What questions do you have here? So how does it actually settle? How do you decide who gets the ticket? 
so it depends on the environment that you are in. So in the blockchain environment, uh, anyone, uh, the block proposer is going to be able to decide that. So writing code with race conditions like this um, really leaves, leaves you up to the will of, of the validators. Yeah. Yeah, so, it, or, yeah, so um, I, I don't think it's really a problem at the language level itself. Like, sometimes what you want to model is non-determinism, yeah, right? right? But I mean that then the non-determinism. Yes, right, and so that's, that's the role that Casper plays, right? That's the consensus protocol. So the consensus is precisely deciding um, who wins these non-determinisms. So they, they might not both be correct, right? So say, say that um, you only have one ticket. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's that's correct. I mean, so that's that's similar to it's a, it's a it's a race condition, right? So, in in Ethereum, you know, you might have the same thing, right? You have two transactions that come into the network or are deployed to the network at the same time, and some uh, block proposers uh, order them transaction A then transaction B. The others order transaction B then transaction A, and the two networks sort of battle it out until they decide and come to a consensus on one or the other happening. Right, yeah. Right, so there's, there's many different strategies that you could choose though, right? And the language itself of, of the EVM doesn't, doesn't really decide. And so that's similar here. And this whole talk, actually, I'm not really gonna be talking about consensus too much. I'm gonna be talking about just sort of the underlying language construction and how we get, um, how it's fundamentally concurrent and how we get types from it. Um, but yeah, thank you. That's, that, is, that is important to think about these things in, in that setting. So I want to give uh, just us a look at some of uh, the other calcula, um, process calculus. So here's the lambda calculus. Um, this is something that you might have heard of as the foundation for functional programming. And sort of by, by looking at that, what we have is, is x is a variable here. This line here is, um, is a, a function essentially, and this is applying a function m to an argument n. And what you can see sort of if you, if you look at this hard enough is, is you can see that, uh, that n and m itself are of the same form. So right already in this very small little, little you know, couple lines, um, we get this idea that, you know, functions and arguments, you know, can kind of mishmash together. Um, we, we can pass around functions to other functions. Um, so that's pretty cool. 
Uh, and then we have the row calculus here. And I'm not going to go through all the details um, if you want to. I'm hoping that you have enough information after this to go into the paper. But just a couple of things that I'd like to point out. Um, before, where we had you know, x and y being any variable name, now we have our x and y are more structured, and actually they like take processes in. So we've sort of like closed up our theory a little bit. We don't have this fuzzy notion of any variable name floating around. Um, we also have these things that are similar to the pi calculus here. And then we have this funny little thing where we can take a, essentially what is a variable and turn it into a process. Um, and you see then in, in the reduction rule too, um, when we send, we send this process Q. So we're not sending a name anymore, we're sending a process. And the process is then turning into a name on the other side when it's received. So this is the idea of like code mobility, right? So we can, we can take code, we can wrap it up, we can send it to another process who grabs the code and can turn it back into a process here. Uh, so further reading on, on this stuff, I would highly recommend um, these two papers, the Polyadic Pi Calculus and Tutorial by Robert Milner and a Reflective High Order Calculus by Greg Meredith. Um, so once we have a calculus, um, in certain cases, we can define uh, categorical semantics for our calculus. Um, and the, the way that this is done in Rolang, um, it's a, a graph-enriched Levere theory. Um, and it's a multi-sorted Levere theory. Uh, that took me quite a while to understand, but I just want to draw a quick little picture for you, which, do we have another? The, uh, the, it's a, it's a, um, I, th 
I think the Mike Stay would probably, I think the technical term for it, so it's a, it's a Levere theory is the basis, and then the Levere theory is multi-sorted in the general case when you're trying to do this with computational calculi. Um, and it is enriched, so that's talking about those, those double arrows, that arrows between arrows, and it's enriched with something called graphs. What are the objects? That's, um, I recommend you look up Levere theories okay. to go to that. I don't really want to go into that right now. Yeah. Um, the, the objects are, I guess, you can think of them as just like a, a higher level representation of our terms uh, such that we're able to really like list all of them that go into the language. So they're not, they're not really terms themselves, they're things that create terms by having arrows that go between them. Um, that's the meaning behind them. But when, when you look at a category like that too, so you can think of this like higher category with the arrows between arrows, you can then like reduce that and sort of look, look at that and think of it as sort of the first picture that was drawn as well where, you know, the, Think of a category where your initial level one arrows are objects and your level two arrows are the morphisms. So it's really just another view on the same thing, actually. Um, and, oh. Yeah, and there, I do have, uh, I thought I had a paper link in here too. Um, I guess I don't. But if you look up um, Mike Stay on Archive, um, there's something like categorical semantics for the um, a pi calculus variant um, is where you'll find the details of that. Um, and I really do encourage everyone to approach these papers if you have interest in them. I don't think that they're that scary once you have this sort of like intuition behind some of the stuff that's going into it. Uh, so I wanna talk about uh, logic as a distributive law, ladle now for a little bit. Um, and to do that, I'm gonna create a pretty simple language. And the language looks like this. We should be familiar with this by now. And um, it's gonna be either one or a prime number or two numbers multiplied together. That's our language. And so in this language, we can think of we have one, two, three, two times two, five, three times two, so on. Um, and from this language, um, given ladle, uh, logic is a distributive law, and given the uh, work that we've, that Mike Stay has done into uh, putting the row calculus into its category definition, we can think about extending our initial language uh, to create a structural type language. So that's what this is here. So notice that these top lines, these top three lines, these are just the same lines from our language up here. Um, and then we've added all of these lines. So we've added now in our type language, we can say A or B, A and B, and so on. And when we look at what the meaning now of these statements are, oh man, I, I missed a couple of things. So um, the way that we think of the type um, in this case is we think of a type as um, the set which contains all elements which satisfy that type. So say we have the type, or say we have the set apple, fire truck, banana. We can think about defining the type of red and really the meaning of that type is the set apple and fire truck. Or we can think of defining the type fruit and really the meaning of that fruit when we're looking at our set is apple and banana. Um, so what, what we wanna have is sort of like a, that general language of talking about things like red and, and fruit um, and 
what we're, what we're going to do is use that language of like the sets of terms and collections um, of terms. So <clears throat> when we, I'm going to go through then what, what this translates to, what the meaning of this is going to translate to in terms of a type. So we have uh, all here. So the meaning of all is just going to be the set of all elements. Meaning of none, set of no elements. And sorry, so this is a set of all elements in our language, so the set of all terms in our language. The meaning of none is nothing. Um, the meaning of not some statement is all terms in our language minus the meaning of the statement A. A and B, meaning the um, meaning of A, intersect the meaning of B. A or B, the union. Um, what questions do you have at this point? So, like, so, so with not, if I use your old example and I want to say not true, like obviously as an English speaker, I know that there's fire charge, but how does that work here? Great, yeah, thanks. So um, this, this set here is fruit. Uh, or is, is uh, apple, fire truck, banana. And then if we have A, the meaning of A, remember, is um, say that A is the term fruit, is um, apple and banana. Then when we take all of those terms minus apple and banana, we're only left with fire truck. So not fruit is going to be fire truck. Yeah. Another question? Uh, so, <clears throat> we also have the meaning of uh, all of these other terms in our language. Um, because we, are, remember our language was not only all these new things that we've added, but also all of the old things as well. And so the meaning of just one in our language is we pick out all things in our language that are structurally equivalent to one. So this would be one, and one times one, and one times one times one. That's what the type one is. Uh, and then the meaning for a specific prime number is gonna be the same thing, pretty much. And then sort of the interesting part, I think here, is that when we have the meaning of these two things pushed together, these two types, pushed together, but now they're not pushed together with like and or 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 not or anything. What they're pushed together with is um, this construction that we had in our initial language that really meant multiplication. So what this is going to say is that we're going to pick out all terms in our language such that our term is composed of two things. We'll call them M1 and M2. And M1 is in the set meaning of A, and M2 is in the set meaning of B. And we'll give some examples. So an example type of the even numbers. We'd have A times two. What is A? Oh, sorry, so uh, this should be all times two. All, all, which is, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I used a here for all, sorry. Um, so odd numbers, right, we can think of just negating that whole statement. Um, then we can try to construct something maybe a bit more difficult in our language, which is the prime numbers. So we can start that is by looking at, okay, well, how would we define, how would we define the prime numbers in this language, right? We don't really have, um, Right? We have this notion of picking out a prime number, but how can we define all prime numbers? Um, the way we'll do that is by first defining the non-prime numbers. So um, one is not a prime, and also uh, what is not a prime is any two things multiplied together given that both of those two things are not one. Question? Okay. 
So then the type for the prime numbers would just be the negation of that whole statement. Now the interesting thing is, is that when we um, take, take this to uh, our row calculus, the form is exactly the same for prime numbers, is exactly the same as the form for our single threaded processes. Right, something that is not the stop process or it's composed of two things and, and both of those things are not the stop process. Um, so if you remember in the, the only information that we've really used so far is the structure of the terms themselves. We haven't said anything about the rewrite rules. The rewrite rules haven't played in here at all. But when we were looking at the category, we had the information about the rewrites in there too. So we can actually use and extend this type system even further to create a structural behavioral type language. And we add two new terms to that, which is possibly A and necessarily A. And possibly A just means that um, in some reduction, possible reduction, I'm going to get something that is of the form A. And necessarily A means that now and for all productions, possible productions, um, I will still be of the form A, of the type A. So this modal um, extension would allow us to say something like necessarily X send, and really, sorry, instead of true here, this should be all. So necessarily X send all means that I will always be of the form sending something on X. And for further reading there, you can talk about, um, you can look up logic of distributive laws, and um, for getting more into distributive laws, distributive laws for Levere theories. But this, this stuff does require, um, you know, more category theory. So knowledge of Levere theories, multi-sorted. Yeah, knowledge of Levere theory is really to do just this case of a lang extending of a language of a monoid. So that's really an overview of, I think, just hopefully enough to just like creak the door open a little bit um, so that you can maybe poke your head into some of these articles and have a good sense for what's going on. Um, yeah, what questions do you have at this point? All right, thanks. <laughs>